Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm very excited to talk to you today about my work on corals. I work on corals uh, because it is fascinating. Corals share our, the same basic biology with us, and yet they live their lives very differently. And studying corals continues to baffle me because it makes me challenge some very basic assumptions, and in turn, that lets me see the world with different eyes. Let me give you an example. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about some very, uh, very basic question. How old are corals? How old are you? That seems an easy question, right? So when I graduated from uh, high school, Whitney Houston's um, I Will Always Love You was the top of the charts, and Howard Stern's radio show just came online, and uh, Bill Clinton was inaugurated as president. This is probably around the time when most of you were born. So, however, most of your tissues are not nearly that old. Most of your tissue is actually only about seven to 10 years old because your cells have to continuously renew themselves and turn over. Now, how come you all don't act like a 10-year-old? Well, it turns out that some cells in your brain and the cerebral cortex actually do not change over, and that might be some of the explanations of why we don't uh, continuously act as if we were 10 years old. Now, what does that have to do with corals? What this illustrates is that physical age and birth age are not necessarily the same thing. So, if we were to be able to ask a coral, how old are you, we would uh, have an easy answer, right? Perhaps. But it's not easy with corals. Corals don't have outward signs of aging like we use for some other organisms. For example, they don't have gray hair, their teeth are not worn down. Um, if you look at corals they, of this particular species, the colonies pretty much look the same. So there's no real outward signs of aging. Now, well, you know, perhaps we can borrow some tools from other fields of science to answer this question. Corals are similar to plants in a lot of ways. They, um, as adults, are sessile. They stay in one spot, just like a tree. And in fact, just like trees, they get most of the tr nutrition from sunlight. Now, they don't do that themselves. Um, it's their partner, single-celled algae that live within their tissues that use sunlight um, with, you know, like, like with photosynthesis like trees do, and the nutrition they derive from that they share with their coral host. And it's that partnership between algal, alga and, and coral animal that builds the reefs that we know. So, well, if corals are like trees in some ways, maybe we can use some of the techniques we use to age trees. For example, if you look at a really tall tree, you know it's got to be old. It has to have taken some time to get that tall. Now, the problem is that that doesn't work with corals either. And um, to explain this to you, I have to show you a little um, video here that I think illustrates that fact quite nicely. Thank you. So this here is a video taken by the Coral Restoration Foundation uh, in the Florida Keys. It shows a near-shore coral nursery where uh, Ken Niedemeyer and his colleagues are growing corals uh, for outplanting back on the reef. And if you look real close, you see a lot of fish that are hanging out underneath these structures. And the way this works is that uh, Ken takes a little clipper and he goes out into the reef and he snips off a little piece of coral and then he hangs those little pieces onto these tree structures that you will see in just a second. Here they are. So he hangs those little pieces on those uh, trees, these, these little clotheslines almost, and uh, there they regrow into large colonies. And they do so much faster on these, in these nearshore nurseries than they do out on the reef. And uh, some of the reasons for this might be perhaps that they're off the ground and there's little competition with other organisms on the reef, and they're exposed to continuously flowing fresh water. So 
But this already tells you that size and age can't be related. If you can snip off a little piece of coral and um, put it on the, on, the, on the trees like this, then a, a small piece can come from a really old, old colony. How come that corals can grow into new colonies from a fragment? I mean, if I were to snip off your fingertip, neither the fingertip would grow into a new person, nor would you regrow your fingertip, right? So some of the answers for this lie in the biology of the corals. These corals are actually colonial organisms. They uh, consist of many, many thousands individual polyps. And each one of the polyps actually is a complete organism in itself in that it has a gut and it can feed, it can reproduce. And so when you snip off a little piece of colony, there's many of those individual polyps that can continually clone themselves and grow into new colonies. So this is what Ken does. He takes advantage of this, and it's, it's a really amazing thing he does, um, regrowing these colonies. And um, you know, the way this came about is actually quite interesting as well. Ken gave up a very lucrative uh, livestock, uh, live rock business in the Florida Keys uh, once he figured out that he could grow corals that got started when his daughter had to do a 4-H project in high school. So he's been uh, doing this for a while, and um, he's taking these coral fragments that you see here and pla plants them out on the reef, where hopefully they will grow into these large uh, coral thickets. So let me see if we can get out of here. Yeah, so um, again, this means, though, that we cannot take size and figure out how old a colony is. What else is there? What else could we use to figure that out? Well, what we need is a clock. We need a clock that keeps time as the corals age. And you, in fact, have such a clock as well in your cells. Every time a cell replicates itself, it needs to replicate the DNA that is in the cell as, as well. And the machinery that does that is actually really very accurate. It very rarely makes any mistakes, but sometimes mistakes do happen. And those mistakes accumulate over time at a fairly constant rate in those genomes. So if we knew two things, if we had some way of measuring the number of mistakes that are present in the DNA, and if we had some idea about the rate at which these mistakes are made, or the mutation rate, then we could combine those and figure out how old that particular genome is. So, in fact, we figured out how to measure the number of mistakes in these coral genomes. We have a very good measurement of that, in fact. What is a little more complicated is measuring the mutation rate. There are no direct estimates of mutation rates for corals. However, there's many of those available for other organisms. And by assuming that the coral mutation rates are similar to those of other organisms, we can combine them in sophisticated models and come up with an estimate of the age of these corals. And in fact, Megan, who is sitting right here, <laughs> um, is the one in my lab who has done most of that work um, and combined those mutation rate estimates with our estimates of the number of mistakes we see in some of these corals to come up with an age. And what happened next was really amazing to me. It really changed the way I look at these reefs and I, uh, the way that I think about how they might uh, react to climate change that is changing their environment as we speak. These corals are very sensitive to increases in water temperature, and just slight increases in water temperature disrupt that partnership between the coral and the algae. And once that partnership is disrupted in a process that we know of as coral bleaching, uh, those corals often die. So increases in temperature are a real worry. However, how old are they now? Well, some of these thickets that you see here might be as old as 4,000 years. 4,000 years, that's, that puts them on par with some of the oldest organisms we know. For example, bristlecone pines. 4,000 years ago is when we put stones on top of each other to build Stonehenge. There's a lot has happened since then. The environment has changed, and um, 
some of these organisms are still around. Well, that's truly amazing. Now, 4,000 years ago, the environment was different. Can that history of some of these organisms tell us anything about whether or not they will stick around um, during this period of climate change? This here is a recent graph of uh, temperature. It's just published in Science. And if you look at this graph here, the black line shows you the long-term average temperature. And that um, your, the, the pink arrow on the left indicates when we estimate some of these corals might have been born, so somewhere around 4,000 years ago. But even if we're wrong about the exact date those corals were born, even if it was just 1,000 years ago, look at what happened to temperature. It continuously decreased. So over the lifetime of these organisms, temperature has decreased until just recently when, in a blink of an eye, temperature increased suddenly. It spiked. This has happened over the last 150 years or 200 years or so. And this is a real concern. As I told you before, these, these organisms are very sensitive to even small changes in, or small increases in temperature. So, taking my scientist hat off for a moment and putting on my concerned citizen hat, when I look at that graph, the only conclusion I can come to is that we need to reduce carbon emissions now. What we need to do is change the rate at which temperature is increasing. These sudden spikes, I don't think, are likely to allow these corals to survive, even though these organisms are true survivors. I mean, they've stuck around for 4,000 years. But the sudden increase is, is like asking you to run an ultra marathon from one day to the next without any training at all. Some of you probably are able to run ultra marathons given enough time and training, but not from one day to the next. So if we are able to slow down the increase, the rate at which temperature increases, some of these truly amazing survivors might make it. Some of these might survive climate change and will allow Ken to use his you know, growing techniques to plant, plant these fragments back out on the reef and they're actually going to survive. You know, if, we, if temperature keeps increasing like it is now, Ken's amazing efforts might not go anywhere because we're just planting those corals onto reefs that continuously uh, worsen in their environmental conditions. So looking at this, um, what have we learned from asking a very simple question? How old are you? How old are these corals? We've learned that for corals, you know, physical age and um, birth age are not the same. We, we've discovered that some of these corals get to be very, very old. And that, you know, makes me wonder, for example, how are they able to get that old? How come they don't get cancer or die of old age? I think there's lots of opportunities there for bright young minds to get involved and make some really groundbreaking discoveries. And combined, I think we have a chance to slow down climate change and make sure that some of these amazing organisms are still around for our grandchildren to see and experience. Thank you.